Good morning, everyone. Um, it's, it's, it's a great pleasure for, for me to, to finally record uh, my keynote that was meant to be presented some weeks ago at the final conference of the World Food and Business Research Program. My name is Frejus Toto. I am the executive director of ACED. ACED is an independent nonprofit organization that combines research, policy, and action to improve food and nutrition security in, in Benin. Within the, the Watro Food and Business Research Program, I was an ARF project leader. And it's exactly from that perspective, I want to share some reflection on the program with you this morning. I had the opportunity to work with researchers from the University of Abu Mekalabi in Benin and the Free University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands on a project that aimed to improve the resilience of small scale inland features in, in, in Benin. And also through various uh, interactions, I, I learned a lot from other ARF projects, which gives me uh, good perspectives on how the program worked over the past seven years and what we could learn and share uh, today as the program is, is closing. So I want to, to briefly introduce you um, to three key issues that um, from my perspective, very relevant for the ARF program um, is theory of change and also how it could move forward. The first issue um, I want to discuss is related to the agenda setting. From the perspective of the ARF program, the agenda setting process should be led by the practitioner. That was made very clear uh, in the program design and also in all of the requirements for the, the, um, for the call for proposals. But in, in practice, goals and, and interests of the researchers and practitioners are not always um, aligned and may even be in some situation very conflicting. This has implications for the formulation of research questions and on which aspects of the food and nutrition security the action research uh, should, should focus. Uh, on, on the same issue of agenda setting, one key element that comes as an important and sensitive um, aspect of the research was how we design uh, research questions at a higher level, um, working with the policy uh, makers. In our experience and from what we've learned over the years, uh, proximity with policy makers to understand their needs and ambition in terms of policy setting is, uh, in terms of policy setting and political challenge is, is very, very key. This was uh, instrumental in formulation um, of research questions in our case that were uh, of high interest, for example, for the Ministry of In, in Charge of, of, of Fisheries. There were uh, people that we were working with for some years before we started that project and the proximity with those um, policymakers was very instrumental in defining research questions that are of interest for them, for us, and that are also scientifically of interest for the researchers. The second issue that I, I, I want to, to highlight here is the research and implementation approach. In the theory of change of the ARF program, it was made very clear that the program wanted um, the approach to be a co-creation exercise, which also have um, implications. The most important one is about how we combine theory and, and practice. Practitioners often complain that researchers are confined in, in theory and try to simplify complex social issues. And at the same time, researchers on their side have the feeling that practitioners do not very often adopt um, a research lens to address food and nutrition security uh, challenge. In our experience and from discussions and interaction that I have with other um, ARF projects, long-term collaboration among researchers and practitioners is something that is very essential to navigate uh, this challenge of co-creation. Of co 
when they know each other very well, when they know uh, how both think and how they can align their interests and, and ambition, when all these things are in place, it's very easier for uh, practitioners and researchers to define a co-creation approach that is um, that's respond to the different uh, needs of the, the two uh, stakeholders. That was something uh, very important in my experience uh, within the ARF project. And I, and I think it's something that should be uh, taken very carefully if you want the co-creation approach to be um, a success. The last issue, um, I mentioned three issues, I've already discussed two. The last one is related to the uh, to, to scaling, which in my opinion should be the focus of all ARF projects as the program is, is now closing. And on this, I want to touch upon the challenge of ensuring that all stakeholders, especially uh, smallholder farmers and poor households have access to the research outputs and innovation, which I, 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 I know is not always an, an, an easy thing. But we cannot address the, the scaling issue if we are not able to make sure that the, 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 uh, the beneficiaries that, that are um, households and small farmers, which are, I mean, the, 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 the main stakeholder that the era program is, is trying to, to impact, if we cannot make sure that they have access to the research output and innovation, we have lost something very important in the in the process. So yes, in, in, in a nutshell, that's what I I, I wanted to, to, to share with you to today. Three key points in terms of um, uh, the, the my learning in, in the ARF project related to the agenda setting, the research implementation, and the issue of um, of, of scaling. I personally think that uh, the ARF project adopted a very a unique and relevant approach for knowledge co-creation. And in the future, such approaches should um, ad address or try to mainstream those three issues that I've just uh, discussed. So thank you very much. That's what I, I briefly wanted to, to share with you. Thanks so much, uh, thanks for your uh, insights as an ARF project leader. I think that's really um, insightful, some of the key elements, I would say, of the program that you're touching upon. Uh, it's really that, that sort of reflection in me that we're looking for also uh, now at this stage, the end of the program, also looking forward. Um, of course, you have indeed already outlined three um, uh, key issues for yourself, um, but could you also, from your position indeed, maybe personal position as an ARF project leader, um, uh, say something more about this, what sort of your key takeaway from the program? Okay. Um, personally, as, 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 as the leader of, an, of a policy research organization and also as, as a project lead within the, the, the ARF, I think my key takeaway from this experience is related to the approach. The ARF program is focused on co-creation among practitioners and researchers, which is something that was made very clear. And learning from what we've experienced in our four-year project and for the seven-year long, um, for the seven-year period of the whole program, that co-creation between practitioners and researchers is something that is feasible. We now have the, the, the evidence the, the case studies, the experience that it is something that is feasible and can lead to useful innovation for the food and nutrition security sector. It's very important for me, and I, I, uh, I think it's, it's the main um, takeaway from this experience within the, uh, the ARF program, because it will now uh, define the whole, or it will now inform, I would say, the whole uh, intervention strategy of our organization uh, as an organization at which try to um, to bridge the gap between the researchers and practitioners. Now we know that um, research questions could actually emerge from practitioners and we did have the experience during four years uh, to learn to see how 
this could uh, be something that is that is uh, feasible. And um, in that co-creation experience, the ARF program was also very explicit in the centrality of the practitioner in the research process. This is something that was for many years acknowledged as, um, as important to ensure uptake and sustainability of the research outputs. But from my experience, um, not much has been done to mainstream this, this approach. Very often, uh, practitioners are, are partners in research projects that are designed and led by, by research organization, which clearly have implications for the uptake and sustainability of the, of the findings. Because when the practitioners do not find themselves in the, the research question, they just act as, 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 a, as partners. When the project closes, the research output stays uh, within the, 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 the scientific papers that were published, but not much um, uh, could be seen in terms of improving uh, the food and nutrition security for, for the different uh, stakeholders. And the AI program, I think, was among the very uh, pioneer uh, program that explicitly uh, required practitioners to take the lead in uh, food and nutrition security research projects. I personally think that this is a game-changing um, approach, and I do hope that um, uh, other food and nutrition security programs would um, uh, reflect along those lines. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, indeed, like you say, it is uh, so for us at NWO Votro, it was the first time uh, that we did um, uh, that we had it arranged as such, indeed, that the practitioner was actually uh, in the lead, uh, was actually the project leader. And that, uh, in that sense, the, the project was in the, the yeah, the, the practitioners were at the steering wheel of the project. And I think that was new and it is uh, insightful that you really um, uh, pick up on the fact that it also has to do with ownership of the results, huh? that, it, that it doesn't stay within the uh, academic realm, but, but that it allows for, for the findings to be continued. I guess that was our assumption at the start also, and it is, uh, in that sense, for me, uh, also as part of the research funder, it's, um, yeah, I would say heartening to hear that, that, that you have experienced it as such. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And uh, then indeed looking forward, I mean, you're saying indeed, you hope that that, that setup will uh, be continued. Um, what, what in general would you say in the future uh, for research programming um, would you advise? Okay. No, thank you very much, Corinne, for, for, for that question, which is very relevant now as most area projects have closed and the program also um, is closing, trying to, to learn from what has been done over the years. For me, one key um, perspective that I think is very important is related to the third issue that I've, I've discussed, the scaling uh, issue. And I think the, 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 the area project should focus now on how to make sure that research outputs remain accessible public goods, especially in consortia where commercial companies are involved. You know, from the ARF um, program setting, there were uh, some commercial partners, uh, companies that were acting as practitioners that work together with uh, researchers to, um, to develop some innovations. I think one key, uh, aspect of the perspective for those uh, projects is how to make sure that those uh, accessible public, those uh, research innovations remain accessible public uh, goods. And I, I, I personally think it's all about the setting and ambition of the action research project. For example, if the project is led by public institutions or nonprofit organizations like ACED to develop innovations for farmers those innovations should remain publicly accessible. After all, it's, 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 it's public money that was used to, to develop those innovations. But it becomes tricky when public money is used by consortia that involve commercial enterprises to develop innovations that could use a commercialization approach for scaling. It can create some, some tensions around how these innovations are made available for those who are most in, in need. I 
think that to navigate this, this challenge is, is very important to define right from the beginning um, what I, I call exclusiveness tolerance. In, 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 a, in a recent published uh, paper in the Knowledge Management for Development Journal with some OCO, uh, with some offers, including uh, you, uh, Corinne, what we call exclusiveness tolerance could be a good starting point of dealing with um, how we make sure that um, innovations are inclusive. So far, we mostly think that inclusiveness should be uh, discussed about how we make sure that it is accessible, uh, either financially, it is, um, I mean, even in terms of location, the, uh, the innovation is, is accessible. But we could also look at it at in, um, in the other way and in defining what exclusiveness level we are able to, to tolerate so that we don't only focus on inclusion, but we make sure that we define right from the beginning with all stakeholders involved in the consortium, involved in the research, what exclusiveness tolerance we should have. For example, if you want to develop a new product for that we think should be commercialized, are we going to make sure that it is commercialized but at the social price so that not so many people are excluded? So I, I think if we, we rethink that, um, uh, that concept of exclusiveness tolerance and we define key indicators and, and milestone that we should, we, should, uh, we should achieve, it will definitely help the ARF project in making sure that the research output remain in a publicly accessible. And when it should be commercialized, it is commercialized in a way that those who are in the bottom uh, in, the, in, I mean, in the bottom of the pyramids, they, they also have access to those innovation because at, in the end, we really want to, to help them and not um, create products that are only accessible to, to, uh, to a, a specific segment of the population. Thank you. Thank you for underlining indeed the importance of thinking through uh, who, who's benefiting from the research that is being conducted indeed, given that uh, research is funded from public funding and thus should be, uh, knowledge should be a public good. And uh, indeed, as you said, uh, you have, um, and I had the privilege to be um, a, a little bit part of it, indeed, uh, a paper that you recently have uh, published on, um, well, some of those tensions eh, in working with private sector, uh, mm -hmm. definitely opportunities it offers, but also some challenges that should be taken on board indeed to, to ensure that um, uh, those who benefit are the, uh, the small scale farmers and those that uh, are part of uh, poorer households, because that is in the end also what this program was aimed for. Eh? Yeah. 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 Thanks so much, Fréjus, for underlining all those very important and insightful points. I'm really happy that we've been able to uh, record this after all, even though yeah. it was pretty much a pity we didn't have you on board in the conference. <laughs> but thanks so much for your insights. Yeah. And uh, I hope that we'll still reach uh, a, a wide audience in this way. Thank, thank you very much, Corinne. It was a very good, uh, it was a great pleasure for me to finally um, present that uh, pitch and I mean that keynote well, that was meant to be presented in the some weeks ago in the in the final conference of the of the program so thank you very much for the opportunity and um, I hope that the issues that we discussed will uh, reach a, a, a larger audience as you mentioned yeah. and it would create uh, it will trigger some reflection on, on how uh, we make sure that knowledge uh, contribute to improve of food and nutrition security. Thanks so much, Fréjou. Thank you, Corinne. Yeah.